So next up, we have, please welcome our guest week speaker, Shane Murphy. Shane Murphy is a sales manager from Home Corp. And um, Shane, I'll pass the mic over to you. Uh, we'd love to hear just a little bit about you, what you do and, and Home Corp and what it's all about as well. Oh, Shane, I think you're on mute. There we go. All right, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks for having us, guys. Um, I've been in the property game since 1989. So been around um, and uh, done a lot of other different things in sales. So I've got a broad experience in sales. I saw a couple of quotes there. One of them popped up was from a guy called Zig Ziglar. For yeah. those of you who are younger, Google Zig Ziglar. Amazing. Amazing. I had the privilege of sharing the stage with him many, many years ago in Auckland, New Zealand, awesome. and actually had lunch with him and his wife and my wife. And um, it's probably still the greatest fanboy moment I've ever had. Um, very, very nice, generous man with his time. So, yeah. Um, and his message, as old as it may appear to you, still cuts through today. So look up Zig Ziglar. Zig okay. Ziglar had one of those... Uh, things and, and there's a lot of people you saw there talking about hard work and getting to the top mm -hmm. and Zig's um, way of describing it was I don't know whether ever you uh, remember the old style hand pumps you'd pump water up from the ground remember you probably saw them in the old cowboy movies over the trough and you'd pump and pump and pump and nothing would ha happen and you'd pump and pump and pump and still nothing would happen. You'd pump harder and longer and harder and longer. Eventually, the water would start gushing out. Once the water was up there, it was nice and easy to keep the water flowing. Mm. And that's how Zig describes making money. It's a lot of hard work, and it looks like you're just wasting your time. And you, um, But once you get it there and the flow starts coming, it's, I guess, the same for these days as you guys probably will use pipe drive or some sort of pipeline software. Yes. Um, that drives your business, it's filling that pipeline. And that's the hard work. Once it starts coming out the other end, life looks easy. It's not. There's a lot of hard work that makes it look that easy. But, uh, yeah, that's thought I'd just share that with you. So what I'm going to do is run through a, uh, a bit of a presentation that you guys put together. I think you're going to do some stuff on Zoom. I'll show you a couple of other bits and pieces as well. And this is a bit that's uh, coupled together uh, from some um, training material and, uh, and presentations that I've done over the years for the guys. So I haven't run through it in this format. Uh, the boys have been putting it in a format that they want to see it done at. So um, uh, if I uh, fumble, it's because I haven't done it. All right, can everyone see my screen yet? Have you shared the screen with me? So I will stop sharing. But uh, then... you hand me the talking stick? Yep. All right, let's stop share this. There we go. All right. Is, is it giving you permission to share, Shane? Uh, share screen. Let's go to now find the one. Hang on. One tick, guys. No worries. Let me know. It might need to give you. Yeah, no, I'll be right now. Um, I'm going to find all the windows. I'm going screen today. I've got multiple screens. Hang on, let's just try again. Share screen, see if it picks up now. There we go. All right, can you see that? Yes, I can see it. Yep, can everyone now see that? Cool. All right, now see if I can actually move. All right. So, guys, um, you guys are going to be doing some calling of leads, speaking to them, and trying to get some cut through. So, um, these leads are coming in on the basis of interest in um, property and property investment, I understand. Is that right? Thumbs up, Paul and Steve? Yeah. So the people coming to you have got some interest. Where that interest lies, how far down the rabbit hole they've gone, um, what sort of knowledge power uh, base they've got, um, you don't know at that point, but that's what this is all about. So a big thing about um, Property Guru Pro and the, and the boys, um, uh, Paul and Steve, is education. So telling ain't selling, guys. Um, and uh, that's something that you'll need to learn. Just talking to people about shit doesn't actually cut through. 
you've got to have a conversation. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have our two new guys, Rocco and Hugh. Can you go live with your mics? Unmute yourselves. Hugh, you're frozen. His internet, yeah, might be a bit delayed. All right. Rocco, yes, yeah, you're there. Perfect. Yep. So, guys, as I was saying before, telling ain't selling. Have a conversation with people. Get commitment as you go through that way and ask questions. When you ask questions of people, rather than tell them the answers, ask them to give you the answers, it means that they've processed it in their mind and they then own that concept rather than just saying yes. Oh, so yeah. you'll see me do that throughout the presentation. So the whole idea of this is you can get this up, you go full screen and then you can um, just click through it. So thanks for uh, having giving us the time today, Rocco and Hugh. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, first of all, I want to introduce uh, Property Guru Pro. Uh, Property Guru Pro is a, a, a um, property education a company that's been around for over 21 years. The principals have been in the industry. They've um, helped over a thousand people uh, become property entrepreneurs and uh, they're very, very passionate. One of the key things about uh, Property Guru Pro is they're really not into selling, they're about educating. And when people have education, they have all the right information, it's very easy for them to make decisions. So as we progress through um, the path, uh, down the pathway with you, um, I want you to ask questions to learn uh, and, and be confident of your knowledge because then decisions will become very, very easy at the end. Make sense? Yeah. All right, let's go. All right, so um, the other thing about Property Guru Pro is they have a wealth creation strategy and it's very, very simple. It's get to three properties and you're free. And we'll explain how that um, works later on. Three properties and you're free. You can keep building the empire. It can become an ex-property mogul if you like. But generally for most of us, once you've got three freehold properties, working becomes optional. And we'll talk about that. So... With the program, we do all the work for you. We provide financial strategies tailored to your needs. We develop the property portfolio plan along with your wishes and wants and desires. Um, we select stock to actually match what you want to achieve rather than just show you who's, who's the flavor of the moment or who's paying us the most money. We tailor it to suit you. Uh, we monitor every aspect of your progress regularly, make sure that um, all the properties are delivering on what they um, were promised, i.e. they're tenanted, they're um, delivering the rents that we're after, et cetera, et cetera. So we're there to help you every step of the way. Yeah. We'll be your property Sherpas, if you will. Okay. Um, and we can't do it all alone. We do have partners uh, in finance. And we work with two very, very well distinguished companies. One is Yellow Brick Road. You've probably seen Mr. Boris on television, the handsome devil, firing people. Uh, and of course, Asset Financial Services. Asset Finance have been in the game uh, for uh, over 15 years and they uh, do a fantastic job. Um, I've been personally working alongside Asset Finance for probably the last 10, 11 years, and they're excellent. Lots of people have got mortgage brokers, but both these groups go way beyond that. Actually, when you buy a property, the way that it's set up, the way that the taxing is set up, um, the way in which the structure is set up will absolutely have an impact on the outcomes for you. I'll give you a great example. Who here, right, show of hands, who here has actually got investment properties or investment property? All right, great, Rocco, you're live. So, Rocco... You've got a good accountant, right? Yes. And does that accountant get all of your tax and deductions back for you on your properties at the end of the year? I, he does. He does. Before I was just getting, um, you know, tax withholding it was coming out of my pay um, every fortnight before I was made redundant. So instead of getting that one lump package, I was getting it every, every fortnight instead. Right. So that means, so that's what I was alluding to. Most people are going, yes, my... My uh, accountant gets me gets my um, uh, tax back at the end of every year. Then that means you haven't got a very good accountant. Because as Rocco was just saying, if you actually work with somebody who does investment properties all the time, you can actually get your tax 
refunds or tax deductions from your property investment back at the e end of every single week, not at the end of every single year. Do you understand that? You can do a thing called a tax variation form and actually, you know, if you're getting $10,000 tax deductions back at the end of the year, you can actually get that um, back each week, not 10,000, but that one fifty second of it. Yeah. That money being in your bank account is a lot better than being in the ATOs. Does that make sense to everyone? Absolutely. So that's a really good thing when everyone wants, oh, no, I've got my broker, I've got that, and that, you know, they think they know everything. Ask them that question because in my experience, 99% of the people that I've asked the question have an answer like Rocco. They've gone, yep, yeah, he gets me all my deductions back at the, every year. And I said, I'm really sorry to say that, but he's probably a wonderful accountant for general but you probably need to get some experts to look over his shoulder because he's costing you money mm. in terms of your investment properties. So there's things that you need to know. That unsettles them a bit. It's always a good thing to do because they go, geez, these guys actually might know more than I do or my accountant does. And that's a good thing. Now, just before we get going, guys, the other thing we need to do is give them a little bit of yourself. Now, Rocco and Hugh, you guys both gave us some really good insights into your thing. So introduce them to the companies you work with, but also yourself. So tell them, you know, 30 seconds about yourself. Oh. So um, I often talk to them and say, well, you know, I've um, been involved in property for many, many years. Uh, all my greatest achievements have come out of property. Um, and, um, and every time I've bought property, I've made money. Every time I've then taken that money to go and try and do something like uh, a bit fancy, like develop or, uh, or um, create other businesses outside of property. I've lost all that money, had to go back to property to make the money again. And then, yeah, so over, over my life, I've been beaten on the head by property uh, half a dozen times, and now I've worked out, Shane, stop trying to do stuff. But the great thing about property is there's no right or wrong decisions. Over time, all property goes up. So even if you bought, and I have done this, at the absolute height of the market, and then two weeks later there's a GFC, those properties I bought then are still worth much, much more than they were. You just have to wait for the next cycle, a 10-year cycle, and sometimes you don't have to wait that long. But it's a very forgiving investment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas other investments I've made, i.e. into shares and companies and investing in funds, some of those I've lost millions of dollars and there's no value left whatsoever. I've got bits of paper uh, for companies that don't even exist anymore. Yeah, and that's not a good investment. So I'm very much about bricks and mortar. Mm. Tell them your story, whether it be a cautionary retail like mine, uh, whether it be like Rocco, who's enjoyed some success in property and wants to share that, uh, by Q, who's really obsessed in starting out and that's why, whatever your truth is, share that little bit of yourself yeah because you're going to then ask them or tend to share a bit about you it's like a date yeah you don't yeah. want to go out on a date and just bore, bore the girl to death talking about yourself you want to ask about her you want to share about you and find that common ground all right so next thing guys before we get into it just want to do the legal bit now i'm not finance qualified um, we're going to talk about some financial concepts, generally speaking today, and how they work for um, many people. If you'd like to find out more about those concepts and how they relate to your personal circumstances, we will organise free of charge for you to have a Zoom meeting with one of our experts who can talk through some things. So Rocco, for example, uh, you know, if your, your uh, tax man wasn't getting you um, your tax back at the end of each week, free of charge, we'd set up a meeting with somebody who can explain how that gets done. Yeah, as well as helping you expand your portfolio, which is great value, isn't it? Absolutely. Awesome. All right. So that's enough about me. Let's find out a little bit more about you. So now this is a typable thing here. So Rocco. Yeah, and we've got Q. Congratulations, you guys are now a couple. You have beautiful looking children. Um, <laughs> Rocco, what do you do for a crust, mate? Um, property consultant. A property consultant, excellent. Oh, mate, well, you're certainly um, going to be able to uh, get a lot out of today, and hopefully, I'll learn some stuff from you. 
Yeah. Uh, and you two? On the same, I probably consult as well. You're a property consultant as well. Wow. Cute ass guys. <laughs> Amazing. All right, now let's get the annual income. Rocco, what's your annual income, mate? Two fifty. Two fifty. Thank you. And for you, Q. Eighty thousand. Sorry, mate. Come at you there, Rocco. That's all right. Eighty thousand. That's bit all right. Older. You make up for it in the looks. All right, now. Um, <laughs> Now, here's the thing, guys, that a lot of couples never do. Um, they never talk about this. So, um, what's your financial goals? So, here's some very common financial goals. Buy your first home. Uh, pay your home off sooner. Pay less tax or secure your retirement income. What's the number one of those for you, Rocco? Tax. Tax? Interesting. And for you, Hugh? Probably, uh, probably pay off sooner. Pay, right, so it's interesting, eh? So, oops, we'll put that for one. So that's uh, for Q. Isn't that interesting? Here you are, you've been married all these years and both of you got completely different um, finance goals. Very, very common, don't worry about that. And that's part of the process that we're doing today is to, to, to try and get you on the path to achieving both those things. Mm. Awesome. All right, so tell us about that, Rocco. I understand on 250, it will hurt every single um, tax time. Um, and you want to obviously get some relief. Certainly, we can help you with that with property. And uh, Hugh, um, obviously, yeah, once you get a mortgage, you want to um, own that property outright much sooner, right? So we can help you achieve that. Let me ask you this. Thank you. Thing. Oops, I've jumped way ahead there. Um, have you ever invested in property before? No. No. Okay. Well, let's say in this case, yeah. you did Rocco. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then we find, so what we're trying to do is here, guys, oh, yeah. uncover where, how it worked out for them. They might have loved it and made a fortune. Awesome. Let's just do more of it. They might have got burnt. That's, that's okay. Let's circle back, find out um, what went right, what went wrong, and then learn from that mistake. Yeah. All right. So, Rocco, where was your first investment, mate? It was in Ballarat. Ballarat? Oh, the rat, eh? And how did that go for you? Oh, it's not bad. I mean, it, the entry level for a four-bedroom, um, two-bathroom house was, was pretty affordable. It was about four four twenty. Yeah. Not bad size of land. Um, when, how long ago was that, mate? About three years ago now. Three years, yep. And what's uh, what's uh, and and how how's it turned out for you? What's the property worth? Has it rented? Um, yeah. you know, if you had to rate your experience, did you make mistakes? Did you crush it? A little bit of both. Well, Where luckily, 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 I bought new, and I didn't yeah. buy existing. Yes. So I got all the tax breaks with that. So you've already won. You've yeah, already won. I got the seven-year building guarantee with that. So at least for the next seven years, I don't have to worry about. Sounds money. like that's uh, you crushed it. Would that yeah. Be yeah. Awesome, yeah. man. Excellent. Very lucky. Okay. So expand on that experience, guys. And go, so, so more of that. And obviously the other thing is you're obviously open to regional areas because they've got room to actually go up in value still. Yeah? Um, with Melbourne sort of at, you know, 800, 750, 800,000 medium price, there's not much room for it to go up. We'll explain that later. All right. Excellent. Now, even if it's bad experience, guys, find out about it, what they would do next time. Right. Because... Property investment is a very, very good game. It's not a bad game. Yeah? Sometimes we make mistakes. All you got to do is learn from those mistakes. All right. So one of the things that uh, people look for in property investment, um, guys, is they look for yield, which is return, and they look for capital gain, which is your price uh, or value going up. Yeah? So one of the things people don't realize, Rocco and Hugh, is that a property can help you pay your mortgage off much faster. Were you aware of that? Yeah. You? The best way to pay off your home is to buy yeah, another definitely. one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The best way to pay off your home yeah. is to buy another one. I'll repeat. The best way to pay, pay off your home is to buy another one. And we'll explain how that works a bit later. But in the meantime, uh, Rocky, you got a mortgage at the moment, haven't you, mate? Yes. Um, can I ask, mate, quickly, what's your mortgage uh, total at the moment, balance? Just say 400 Let's say 400K. 
and uh, whoops. And what are your uh, monthly repayments? So sixteen. Let's say yeah, sixteen hundred a month. Oh. And how many years to go on your mortgage? Oh, 25. 25. Who's the Minister of Finance in the family? Uh, Hugh, you got a calculator there? Yes, I do. Your phone yeah. Yeah. So, really good thing to ask with is who's the Minister of Finance in the family? And they'll either go him, her, or that one will put the hand up. Which is a really important question, guys, because guess what? You just found out who you need to impress, who you need to convince. One of them will always defer to the other one in terms of things in finance. Have you noticed that? Yeah? So the best way to also get that person involved yeah. is get them to do the math. And then when they do it and tell you, it's right. Yeah? Not you, yeah. just telling them. Okay, and how many years left to go on the mortgage? Oh, it was 25. It's a 25 year old loan. So 20. 25 year loan? Yeah, yep. I'll say 23, 23. You got 23 years left. All right, so you're doing 16,000 a month times 12. 1,600, sorry, a month times 12. Uh, times 23 years. How much is that, Q? I think you're on mute, Q. Did you that last? Sorry, do you mind saying that one again? All right, so $1,600 a month times 12 months, then times 23 years. $21,000. 19000 times three, 57600 ah. uh, So it should be 1600 times 12. Times 23. So we're getting the monthly repayments, we're working it out to be a year, we're then timesing it by the remaining years. 1,600. What was it, sorry? 441,600. 1,600. Okay, 441,600. So here's the thing for you, mate. You got a $400,000 mortgage um, and uh, you've been paying for at least seven years by the looks of it. Yeah. So you've paid probably almost 20 grand a year into it and it's still got 441,600 left to pay. Sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. That's why the banks are making record profits. So I just want to show you something that you've all heard of these before. Most of you probably have them, but a lot of them aren't using them correctly and we'll show you how to use it. So one of the ways that you can really pay your mortgage off faster is by using a offset account. I'll explain. So you see my cursor there. So let's say you've got a normal bank account. Your five thousand dollars a month pay goes into that, and you've got a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Yeah. Whatever is in your bank account has no impact on what's in your mortgage. But if you change your bank account for an offset account, when your five thousand dollar pay goes into your offset account, it reduces your mortgage by the amount that's sitting in your offset account. So suddenly. 100,000 becomes 95,000. Does that make sense to everyone? As you spend, it goes back up again, of course. But what that means is your mortgage interest is calculated on the daily outstanding balance. So every single day, your pay is sitting on your offset account. You're paying interest on 95,000 on your mortgage as opposed to 100,000. Now that may not sound like much, but over a 30 year mortgage, it adds up to be a considerable amount of money. And just by running your money through a different sort of bank account, you can shave up to 10 years off the life of your mortgage or more. Just by changing the way you bank. All right. And again, I'm not the expert, but if you'd like to find out how this can work for you, we'll get the experts at, um, at Asset Finance to run the numbers and show you how it works for you. But how would you like to be mortgage-free 10 years earlier just by changing the sort of bank account you're using, you? Your dream come true. All right, so I'm here to tell you that I've done this twice. I paid it off in seven years once, got divorced, and then, <laughs> and then had to pay it off again in seven and five and a half the second time. All right, so it is possible. It's just math. 
And it's ridiculous when you get shown how I felt like a bloody idiot. Because I'd been in the property game for donkey's years. I thought I knew everything. I didn't know this. So just to understand that you're all experts within our little wheelhouse, but lean on other people who've got other skills. Yeah? We can't all know everything. All right. So that's enough about that. We'll tease that. We'll save that for later. But I know you're looking at property investments, guys. So I want to run through the pros and cons of all the most common types of properties that you can invest in and see which one. We'll try and work out which one suits you. All right. So number one, uh, existing houses. So buying existing houses. Uh, Rocco mentioned something there before, but we'll look at it. So the great thing about buying an existing house is you get an immediate rental return. You can put a tenant straight in, start making money. You can actually see what you're getting. You can walk through, touch it, see it, know exactly what you're buying. They're generally in more established areas than when you're buying um, uh, a, a new property. Um, there's no body corporate costs for uh, freestanding houses as opposed to townhouses and apartments. And probably the broadest resale market of all property types would be a house. More people want to live in a house than all the rest of the options. Would that make sense? Yeah. So the cons of this, um, this is what... Uh, Rocco was saying, generally an older house, more than seven years old, there's no depreciation or tax deduction benefits remaining. It's been sucked out. Also, as I've done, I bought a couple of 10 year old houses, all the appliances sort of come to an end of their life all in one go and you have to replace them all. Um, greater maintenance issues in old houses, um, you know, building specs and, and requirements are actually a lot better these days. One of the few things that people can actually look at and say we've got better at building over the years is houses um, uh, because there's a lot of compliance and a lot of things we've learned. Um, renters prefer new homes. Simple. Everyone wants the bright, shiny one, you know. Um, and also, when you buy an existing property, you have to pay stamp duty on the entire property value, house and land. Yeah. So good and bad, let's look at that versus new houses. Um, great thing about buying a new house is you get those tax depreciations. Um, so you get all those tax deductions. You can write off all the chattels back down to zero and you know get tens of thousands of tax deductions. All the appliances are under warranty, they break down, no problem. We've had one where uh, we had to replace uh, four times. They had to replace the air condition unit one house till someone worked out that someone had wired it wrong and that was causing it to blow up so um but every time no worries replacement under warranty um less maintenance issues with new houses because they're built to different and higher codes uh nobody corporate costs again easy to get tenants because renters prefer new homes now here's the great thing about house and land packages if you've got a house value of 250000 a land value of 250000 you only have to pay stamp duty on the land portion. Yeah? Whereas if you buy an existing house, you only have to pay stamp duty on the 250000 If you buy an existing house worth 500000 you have to pay stamp duty on the entire 500000 So that's why uh, there's great savings. It, again, it you know, can be run into tens of thousands of dollars in savings by buying something off the plan, house and land package. Uh, houses generally appreciate greater in value than units, townhouses, etc., etc. And again, the broadest and easiest thing to sell in the world, uh, resale is a new home. All right? So if you look at that, guys, new versus old houses, Rocco and Hugh, what do you think? New versus old for investment? New. New? Would you agree, Hugh? Definitely new. All right, so see what I'm doing yeah. here, guys. I'm getting a point-by-point -point agreement from them. So they've just agreed that new houses are better than old. Perfect. Yeah? I'm not telling them. I'm asking. Educating, asking. Educate, ask. Cool? So let's move on to apartments and units versus um, uh, townhouses. So apartments and units, look, they're great. They're often a central location that otherwise you couldn't afford. Um, you share in the cost of facilities, again, that otherwise you couldn't afford. Uh, there's often on-site management, which is awesome, unless you're the noisy unit that keeps getting the door knocked on. Um, it's ideal for self-managed super fund investments. 
because a super fund has to have a completed product to be put in it. Uh, so that's where they do well. And in theory, you can put a, a thousand, oh, sorry, you can put a 10% deposit down now. And there's normally a, a, like an 18 month selling period or 12 month selling period, then an 18 month construction period. So sometimes it's two or three years between putting down your deposit and actually having the thing delivered to you and settling. And you can have obviously a lot of um, uplift in value before you even get handed the keys. Yep. Conversely, it can go the other way. All right, so the cons, often there's a one to two year wait. So, you know, if you want to get started and start making money now for property, then you're gonna to have to wait and that's not good. Uh, body corporate costs uh, eat into your thing. So just be aware, body, body corporate costs and property management for on-site they can really, really get up there. And it, it's, it's a, an industry, I think, that's just a bit of a rort sometimes. And there's a lot of overcharging going on. Um, the other thing that uh, you um, have to look at is you pay stamp duty on the entire price if you're buying a unit. Yeah? Uh, they often don't appreciate at the same value as house and land. In fact, most banks will give you, lend you a higher LVR or higher percentage on house and land versus an apartment. Why do you reckon that would be you? Why would banks lend higher LVR on a house and land versus uh, an apartment? Rocco, anyone help him out? Jump on in. Because there's more room for growth. So more opportunity. The, value, the values in the land. Banks more realize that an apartment with a tiny share of a lot, bit of land versus a house sitting on a decent sized block, the value is in the land. So they'll lend you 90% or more on a house and probably five or 10% less on an apartment. They also see that house values are much less up and down. They're much more stable. Yeah, we'll find out why later. Um, the other thing, and right now we'll find out, the reason for that instability is this guys, Let's just say that we all bought into the same apartment block and it was finished and we're all being given the keys today and we're all going to rent it out. What's going to happen? Suddenly we've got us plus another 250 people all advertising their units for rent in the same building mm. on the same day. What do you think is going to happen to rental prices? Go down. They're going to go down. That's why virtually every single time that people buy in an apartment, they get a rental uh, uh, estimate and it never comes up to that because there's always a race to the bottom to get a tenant. It settles over time, but yeah. you're starting off on a low base. It's not good. Does that make sense to everyone? Whereas with an apartment, uh, sorry, with a house and land package in an estate, generally they might put out 10 new houses a week or something if they're really hammering. And so it's slow release, the market absorbs it. So it's not 250 boom on the same day, yeah? Yeah. All right, often you get younger, more transient tenants um, in uh, apartments. Families prefer a bit of land for kids and dogs to run around. You can lose substantially prior to handover if the market goes against you. And there's also a narrow resale market. Less people want to live in an apartment or unit than they want to live in a house, all right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at that versus townhouses. Oh, there's some lovely ones that we're building here at Homecourt. All right, the great thing about townhouses is very similar benefits to uh, apartments. Oh, look, the other thing, guys, with apartments, there's been a lot of bad press about them lately, deservedly, cracking syndrome, those ones that have got the cladding that's bursting into flames. Um, there's a real bad smell about apartments at the moment, and a lot of people are avoiding them as investments for those good reasons. They, they, the industry needs to tidy up its act, and, and restore a bit of confidence. Yep. So a townhouse gives you very much the same opportunity to buy cheaper somewhere where you otherwise couldn't afford. But the thing about this is that small courtyard, that little bit of dirt that comes with the townhouse means that suddenly you're in the market with families, people with pets, people with children, much prefer to have that courtyard. Yeah. A lot of families now are giving away the idea of having a big backyard and they're taking their kids across the road to the park to kick the football. So 
that's what I like about townhouses. Again, all the same benefits, but without that downfall. Also, also there's a lot less that can go wrong in a one, two or three story townhouse that can compared to a high rise where you've got all those issues. All right. All right. So the other thing, guys, I just want to give you a tip. How would you like to be able to guarantee 100% occupancy on all your properties for the rest of your life? Who'd like that? Raise your hands. All right. You can do it. Now, I was very lucky I got taught this when I first became an investor. It's very simple. Accept pets. Who here has got pets and has been through the, the hardship of trying to find a rental property when you've got a dog or a pet? All it's right. a nightmare. You'll pay over the odds. You'll pay another 20 dollars $50 a week if you can have the dog. You will not move after you've been through the runaround. You just wait. You'll keep renewing. It's too much of a pain in the bum to find another place with your dog. Now, that dog is a family member. You're not going to get rid of the dog. You're going to stay there. Every year, they're going to put the rent up, and you're going to be happy to pay it and stay there because they've accepted the dog. Yeah? Now, if you do that, guys, you've got insurance, you've got covered. If the dog rips or wrecks something, you're all good. You got. There's no reason to not accept them. Accept pets and you'll always be full. Does that make sense to everybody? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, it works. And that's where townhouses come in great because people with kids and pets like that little bit of dirt. All right, moving along. So let's have a look at the townhouses versus apartments, guys. Which do you think, Rocco and um, Hugh? I'm going to go townhouse. for the townhouse. Townhouses, yeah. we both agree. Awesome. Hey, we're getting on the same page here, boys. Great. Awesome. All right, now <laughs> I want to talk about duplexes and dual keys. So duplexes you've probably heard of. They're two houses, often mirrored, joined together with the garage in the middle. Um, and basically the price of that is you get two tenancies equals two incomes. You've got rental returns of 6 to 7% per annum, which is bloody awesome. Try and get that in the bank these days. Um, you get greater depreciation and tax deductions. Think about it. You've got two kitchens, four bathrooms, all those chattels. You say so you get a lot of greater uh, depreciation. That extra income can help pay off your mortgage much faster. Yeah? The duplexes will not only pay their mortgage, they'll give you some money in return as well pop that into your mortgage and help let it pay off home faster. Remember your debt and your interest on your investment properties is 100% tax deductible. Yep. Your debt and your interest rates on your home mortgage is not. So pay the bare minimum interest only on your investment properties, all the extra money, pay off home. Make sense? Yep. Home is the master, investment properties are the slave, keep paying all that extra money towards home until home's freehold. Yeah, that's where your investment property will help you. All right, it maximizes the potential of your block. Everyone wants to maximize. You spend all this money on the investment. You may as well maximize it. Yep. You can strata title and sell separately. So you do have to pay some extra costs to, settle it, uh, to separate them, but it means when you go to sell, you've got two properties rather than one, and it'll be good. The only downside of that is you've got to pay two sets of rates while you're doing that, but anyway. Uh, but you do get some instant equity. Uh, so yeah, two sets of rates on the con side. Small body corporate costs, not too much. Normally it's just sharing of a driveway, a bit of insurance, not that big a deal. Um, again, you have to generally you have to pay stamp duty on the entire price and um, a narrow resale market. Less people want to live in a, a unit where somebody's got an adjoining wall, right? Mm. Now, on that front, the walls these days are much, much better than they used to be in the old days. Um, you can hardly hear them. They're very good for noise and they're fire retardant for a long time as well. So that's a duplex. I want to talk about dual occupancy. Very similar. You've got a one bedroom on, on one side. You've got a two bedroom on the other. There can be variations. The difference with the dual occupancy is you still get two tenancies and two incomes but you only get one set of rates. So dual occupancy, how it differs from a uh, duplex is it's two dwellings on one uh, lot. You don't get to separate them, which means you don't have to pay two sets of rates. Um, 
and uh, you still get the two incomes. So these are only allowed in certain councils. South East Queensland, is, uh, a lot of the councils allow them up here because we're getting extraordinary population growth. And this is a great way of being able to double the dwellings on each piece of land. So they're great for investors because this is the highest possible yield on the lowest possible cost. So you get, still get those rental returns. So two incomes, one set of rates. Um, nobody corporate fees, graded appreciation, all those same benefits. Um, you build them as a house and land package and you only pay stamp duty on the land. Yeah? So excellent. Again, it maximizes the size, of, uh, your, the uh, potential of your block and all those other things. They're also becoming really, really popular. We're selling a lot at the moment to owner occupiers, particularly multi generational families. Yeah, a lot of them are taking advantage of the um, of the twenty five thousand um, grant that's going on at the moment. The fifteen thousand first home buyer grant. Mum and dad move into one side. Daughter uh, moves in on the other side. So mm. it allows you know everybody to have their own privacy, their own space, um, and their own bills. So they're set up with separate meters and all the rest of it. Uh, alternatively, you can move in one side and rent out the other. Mm. Yeah. So they offer a lot of lot of options. So that's dual occupancy, super super popular up here in southeast Queensland, getting harder and harder to get hold of, um, because the councils have worked out. Hang on a minute, we're missing out on millions of dollars worth of revenue if we force everyone to do them as duplexes. We'll get double the uh, rates. So that's why you're seeing councils forcing people to do duplexes rather than dual occupancy. Duplexes cost you another uh, thirty thousand dollars infrastructure fees up front. They also cost you um, two sets of rates, two sets of insurances ongoing. Yeah, you do get the upside of some some value at the end when you sell it, but you're probably paying for it along the way anyway. So that's why a lot of the councils are starting to stop these. But whilst they're still available, they're really really good investments. So duplexes versus dual occupancy. Where do we come on that one, boys? Dual occupancy. Yep. Hugh, what do you think? Dual occupancy. Beautiful. So, guys, we've just narrowed it down. So, we've got new versus old. We came out on new. We came out on townhouses versus apartments. And we came out on dual occupancy versus duplex. Out of the three winners, who's the grand champion, do you think? For you guys. I think the dual occupancy. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to argue with that too. You, what do you think? Dual occupancy, for sure. Perfect. So see what we've done, guys. We've done a guided discovery, and suddenly you guys are so hell-bent on owning something you didn't know about 20 minutes ago. How good is that? Mm. Yeah. Very good. And the only place to get dual occupancy, really, these days is South East Queensland. It's very, very rare to get a right. most Queensland, yeah. Great. And guess Shane, who how, long, how long until they cut that off? How long have we got? Uh, mate, uh, last year, Logan Council, which is Southern Ipswich and Western, so Southern yeah. Brisbane and Western Brisbane both stopped it last year. Yep. We went and bought uh, about 150 lots that had previous approval, and we've still got a handful of those. And now Morton Bay Shire, which is North Brisbane, heading towards Sunshine Coast. That shire still allows them, so that's where we're building most of them. The great right. thing about that, Rocco, is those who jump in now, they, they won't be making any more, so the value of them's got to go up, right? Mm, so they're really, really good. So there's, and, there's your urgency on that one. There's your urgency, exactly. And, and it's all fact. They can look it all up. No one's telling them any lies. We're just educating them. And the urgency's been created by the scarcity. Yeah. Yeah? Right. Cool. Awesome. All right, moving forward. So, guys, before I wrap it up and um, get some information to start formulating a plan for you, I'm going to just talk to you about the seven principles of property. Now, these things are ones that you've no doubt heard of and experienced before, but there's some little twists on them. So, again, knowledge is the key to smart investing. We want to leave with some knowledge. All right, so the first rule of investing is this. Don't put all your eggs in there. Same basket. Same basket. Now, note that I made him finish the sentence for me. Yeah? Is selling he ain't selling. Yeah? He's just told me and he's agreed. Yeah, he's had to compute and go, yes, I understand and agree that concept. 
Hmm. Right, so here's the thing, guys. That most, the number one mistake we see people making. I'm in Melbourne. Melbourne market's been going great. I live at uh, Footscray. Footscray's been going off its tits. So I'm going to buy, you know, down the street. Here's the thing. You've just told me, do you agree with that principle, Rocco, don't put your eggs in the one basket? Absolutely. Yeah. Hugh, do you agree as well? Yeah. So why would you put the biggest egg that you've ever bought, your home, and then the second biggest and most expensive egg, and often it's more expensive than the home because you're buying it after, right? Mm. Um, your two biggest and most expensive eggs you're ever going to buy in your entire life, why would you put them in the same basket, even the same suburb? Does that make sense to yeah. you? Because I can cast the net more broader. Why, why limit myself to the one suburb? Um, as you're saying, you know, it probably goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and you're also saying there's more opportunities, say, in the south of part of Queensland where you can do those dual occupancies where you can't do that in Victoria. So. Well, let's have a look at what's happening with COVID, guys. Just by sheer dumb luck or bad management, yeah, Victoria's been hit for six. Your economy's going to be a couple of years behind the rest of us coming out of this, let's be honest. Yeah. So speed economy. investing in different states where there's different drivers means that you've got less risk. Yeah, If one of yours is in Queensland, your house is going to be slow for the next few years and it will, hey, at least Queensland's going to be taken off out of this because they've been COVID safe. Yeah? More by good luck than good management. But that's the idea of why you diversify. We all on board with that? Yep. So okay to look beyond Footscray and beyond Melbourne, right guys? Right, so see what I'm doing? I'm getting commitment from these guys on the type of property they want to buy and also getting commitment from them and through education that it doesn't make sense to do what we all do, which is buying something close by and look further afield, different states. It does make sense, but you have to actually educate the people towards it. Make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. Next thing, use logic, not emotion. You buy investment property with your head, not your heart. Base your decision on the numbers, guys. Yeah? We love the idea of dual keys. We love the idea of maybe southeast Queensland. But let's get the experts to run the numbers with your circumstances and show you how that pans out versus something else. Yeah? So it's not about the trendy facade or the, so the trendy um, suburb that you want to invest in or the pretty facade of the house. If it's a box that delivers a thousand bucks a week, it's a bloody good box. I don't care where it is, what it looks like. Agree? Yeah. So let's, we agree we'll let the, the numbers do the talking, yeah? Uh, on that, look at logic, you know, property versus shares. So here's an interesting one. Here's the Australian stock market versus residential property. As you can see, there's been a lot of rises and falls in the uh, stock market, but house prices have consistently gone up and up and up. In fact, it's counter-cyclic. At the moment, we're heading into a big global financial crisis brought on by COVID. And what's happening with house prices? They're going up. And the reason for that, guys, is always go to property whenever there's a global financial crisis, not just because the share market turns into a jittery mess and people lose their shirts, but what happens is the fastest way for governments to stimulate, stimulate the economy is to put stimulus packages on property. You've seen them do it with the 25,000 and boom, the whole place has gone nuts. The reason why they do that, guys, is if you build a house, you feed 50 families. Think about all the people involved in building a house. The bricklayers, the painters, the guy that sells the, the um, hardware, all the way through, there's so many people, 50 families get fed building a house, yeah? And there's a lot of other GST stamp duty revenue flows back to the government, so they get the money straight back anyway. So that's why always around the world, as soon as it goes to crap, go into property, because uh, the government's about to do a huge stimulus package. That's what's happened again. And look at this, this is showing Australian property as uh, against the backdrop of all the major financial crises that have happened along the way, including the global financial crisis. As you can see, it's been little dips and it's gone on its merry way. So again, guys, I'm very big on 
uh, bricks and mortar versus paper investments, this is probably why. Logic would tell you it's safer, right? All right, so the other thing I want to do, uh, the third principle is this. Property gives you three incomes. So let's just say you had half a million dollars to invest, Paul and you. You can put that in the bank and you can get 2% return. Or well, maybe it's even hard to get that these days, isn't it? Because uh, mortgage rates are lower. Um, but let's say you got 2%, that would give you 10,000 annual income before tax. Yeah? Not exactly sexy, is it? Give me half a million dollars and I'll give you 10,000 a year. But if you put that half a million dollars into a rental property, you'd get first income, 500 bucks a week rent, 26,000. Let's say it goes up at 8%, which has been the average over the last 50 years. An extra 40,000 in capital uh, growth. And let's just say you save net 6,500 in tax, which would be very, very conservative. So that same investment has returned you 72,000, 72,500. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. That really spells it out for you. This is why we love property. It's why property is Australia's favourite investment. You get not one, not two, but three returns from one investment. How many other investments do you know of, team, where you get three returns on the same investment? None that I know of. And you can insure against something going wrong. Wish I could have insured against the companies I invested in prior to the GSC going broke. All right, now I teased before about best way to pay off your home is to buy another home. I'll show you how that works now. So at the moment, you've got your normal pay going into your mortgage or set account. Remember, we're going to do it the other way. And then you've got your rental income and those tax deductions, all, those, all this money. Yeah, coming into your mortgage offset account. And while that money stays in there, it reduces your mortgage by that amount. So you're saying you're paying interest on a lot lower balance, aren't you? This is what's achievable. You can take a 30 year mortgage, 400,000, which will pay $329,000 in interest over that time, by the way. It's crazy, isn't it? 329,000 in interest plus the original 400,000. You paid over 700,000 for your $400,000 home. You can actually pay that same mortgage off in 12 and a half years and only pay 137,000 in interest. All this is just math. Now again, guys, this is just an example. When you commit and do a Zoom with our financial guys, they'll be actually better do your numbers and tell you how much faster you can pay off your mortgage. You, how would you like to know how much faster you could be mortgage free, mate? I'd love to know. Love to know. All right, Rocco, yeah? You'd be keen on that too, wouldn't you, mate? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so when you, when you do the Zoom with those guys, I'm gonna get some numbers from you today. They're gonna to go away and crunch those numbers, and they're gonna come back with one of these graphs with your actual numbers on it. It'd be pretty exciting. Mine was seven and a half years. And it worked out, actually worked out. It's just numbers, not, not magic, just numbers. All right? All right, what am I doing here? Hey, Shay. Oh, yes. Just, just before we continue, um, it's amazing and so valuable. Uh, is, would it be all right if we maybe have a short little intimate break um, for about two minutes so everyone can just run to the bathroom or have a stretch of the legs and then come back? No worries. All good. Uh, All right. Do we have to click back on the same link? Uh, no, we can just stay on the Zoom. Just put your thing on mute or your camera off. So we'll all stay on the Zoom. Um, but everyone just, if you need to go to the bathroom or stretch your legs and then come back in about two to three minutes. All right. All right. Well, Thank you. Shane, Thank you. Shane, while everyone is actually going on a break, can I ask you something? If you just go to the previous slide. Uh, yep, so how much you can, can you save? So it says uh, interest saved is 190K for a mortgage of 400,000 traditional monthly repayments if done without the investment property or anything. Yep. Interest saved is 190. Uh, if, if they do ask, if you can just elaborate the little numbers and the calculation behind this, that would be great. Again, that's what they do with when they uh, come to... Um, the Zoom and they sit down with the finance guys, they'll run through all those numbers. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Again, I don't want to get into it because I'm not qualified financially. Yeah. Um, but again, that's the whole purpose of today is just to say, hey, is this something you'd be interested in? Which the answer is yes. Then I'm going to get some information from you later. And then the experts who are qualified are about to crunch the numbers and go through it line by line with you. But the basic principle comes back to this. There. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So instead of just your 5,000 going into your bank account, you've now got all the rent, hmm. yeah? all that tax, because you're getting it back at the end of each week, not at the end of each year. And that pushes this 100,000 down to 85. Now, hmm. as you spend that money, this goes down and this goes back up again. But every single day that money sits in your account, you're paying interest on 85,000 versus a a hundred thousand, yeah, yep. and that saves you a considerable amount of money. Yeah, so these guys will show you how it's done. It's not rocket science. Lots of people have done it in mortgage um, rapid repayment programs, um, but the key thing is to get your structure right to maximise the way of doing it. I had mine done. One of the ways of expanding it um, is to have. Um, everything be paid on credit card because a credit card will get you an extra month, sometimes up to 60 days of, um, of, uh, of um, credit free. So that means, think about that. So let's say it's there for a month. That means that 5,000 is on there, keeping this down to 95 for a month. Yeah, if you've got 60 days interest free, the end of that month, another 5,000 comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. So suddenly 95 becomes 90. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah. you're delaying your payments, which means that money's staying in your offset account, interest is calculated on the daily balance, and you're winning. It yeah. adds up to a lot. It's a little bit like the old thing where you, just, where you say you heard about the guy who invented chess and his reward was one grain of rice on the first square, that times one, and then compounds and compounds. It was like three times the amount of rice in the world by the time he got to the 64 squared. Well, yeah, it's kind of like that. It, 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 it's mind blowing, but it's true. Yeah. Sure. Cool? Yep. All right, are we all back? All back. All right. Awesome guys, and if you do need to go, because I know we're running over time, the meeting will be recorded, so you can always refer back to it. Um, but yeah, just try and hold on if you can. All right, so guys, the other thing, remember we said at the beginning our whole thing was get to three and you're free. Um, we'll show you about how that works later, but this is what's potentially possible for you. Now, this is something that um, I um, have done with my wife, bought three properties all in one go, or well, one was the family home <laughs> that I had to buy the other half off my other wife, and then... We bought two properties, whacked them all in there in one go. And basically, you use the income from these two to pay off home, and then this, and then that, and then you get it all knocked over very, very quickly. Now, we had really high income producing ones, and we got everything knocked over very quickly. But for most people on normal income, sufficient income to be able to buy a property, you can actually pay off three homes in 30 years rather than just one using the same principle. Mm. Instead of then being, um, you know, having mortgage free, you're actually now set for life. Yeah? Same amount of effort. It's just about structuring it differently. All right? That is very possible. Would you like to find out how that could work for you, Hugh and Rocco? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah? All very possible, guys. Again, the guys from Asset will run a plan showing you what one property and two properties will do for you. Yeah? All right, now a lot of people say that's amazing, but you know, I've already got one mortgage, I'm flat out um, affording that. How can I afford two more mortgages? And this is what my thinking was like. Very many years ago, uh, I used to run Prudential in New Zealand. I used to go down to the Wellington branch. There's a guy there called Nick Cree, and Nick got up to about 11 or 12 properties. Every time we'd go down there, he'd pick me up and I'd take. It'd take me, I'd take him to lunch and on the way, oh, I'll just show you the new property we bought. And when he got up to about 11 or 12, I said, mate, how are you getting all this money? Because 
I know what you're on. I'm on double you. How's it happening? Is Tracy, your wife, family got lots of money? And he said, no, mate, opium. I went, what do you mean? You're importing drugs. And he went, no, OPM, other people's money. And I went, well, what do you mean? And he sat down and he drew this on a napkin. He says, I'm not paying for them. He says, my tenant's paying about 70% of the cost of the mortgage. The tax man's paying about uh, a quarter. And I'm just chipping in 5% here and there. In fact, of these 11 properties, about six or seven actually were positively geared, so they paid him money each week. So to hold these 11, 12 properties cost him, from memory, $35 a week net out of his own pocket. And that's when it dawned on me that three mortgages doesn't mean that I'm paying for them. So it's just a mental thing we have to get through in our minds. And after that, I was hooked. And that's a very true story. I then rang my friend Ian Hoffman, who was over here, and said, I want to know about this negative gearing thing. Yeah, and I quit my job and I've come over here and worked in this industry ever since. That's drawn on a, uh, a napkin in uh, Wellington many years ago, changed my life. So hopefully it'll change yours as well. Does everyone get that concept? And has everyone been in the same headspace where I was, which was, oh, bloody one mortgage is too much. I don't want three of them. How can Nick afford 11 mortgages? He's not. Other people are paying for them. He's just being smart, being the landlord. All cool? All right. So the other thing is we talk about property tax deductions. Nearly 100% of all costs of um, owning a property are 100% tax deductible. All fees, charges, even the interest you pay in your mortgage is 100% tax deductible. I mean, it means on the average property, there's at least 35,000 a year in tax deductions, which is about 10 grand tax back net in your pocket, which is awesome, yeah? So the more the merrier, you've got plenty of tax to offset, Rocco, you should be loading up. So we look at how much you do pay. Let's have a look. So uh, Rocco, we don't even go up to your scale, mate, but let's have a look at uh, 80,000 for you, Hugh. Um, that means you're paying about 400 bucks a week in tax. Yeah, roughly, you know, depending on what deductions yep. you've got, which means over 10 years, you'll pay almost 200K, 361 over the next 20 years while you're working. So if you go up to... Uh, Rocco, let's say, is on 150. Yeah, he's going to pay a million bucks over the next 20 years in tax. Yeah, now here's the great thing about um, your tax, guys. You don't have to pay it. Yeah, it's not a certainty. Yeah, the government will let you keep your tax as long as you spend it on stuff that's good for you and more importantly, good for them. And two of the things that the government is struggling with is our retirement and the shortfall in housing. Would you agree? Always two big issues. So when they entice you to build an investment property and rent it out, you're building wealth for yourself, which means they won't have to look after you in retirement. And you're providing, social, you're providing housing that people can rent. Now, here's the thing. You think, why would they pay a quarter of the cost of your property? Yeah? Why would they do that for you? The alternative for them, because we haven't got enough houses, mm. is the government would have to build Jobs. all of the houses and provide social housing, right? Which means they'd have to pay 100% of the cost, not just a quarter. Does that make sense, guys? That's why the government offers these wonderful incentives for property investors and people building and renting homes. Yeah? It's a very simple equation. They either pay a quarter of it to encourage you to do it and get the win that you become a self-funded retiree, they don't have to prop you up later on in life. Uh, or they have to pay 100% of the cost and do a whole heap of social housing. Always good, I think, to explain why the government does it. Then when people understand, they don't keep looking the gift horse in the mouth. All right, so there's a lot of reasons why you need to look at these numbers, guys. There's over a million reasons, isn't there? Imagine if we could cut that tax bill of yours in half, guys, which I've seen these people do for some of our other clients. How excited would you be, Rocco? Very excited. Yes, very excited. All right, awesome. Uh, principal, sir, again, guys, they'll run the numbers and show you exactly how much one property, two properties, three properties will cut off your tax bill, Rocco. Yeah, and then you can make the decision where you're comfortable. Okay, 
Next principle is the principle of leverage. We all understand what a lever is. It's a, a tool that allows you to lift a big heavy object with a minimal amount of effort, isn't it? In this case, the big heavy object is a property worth 400,000. The minimal amount of effort is the $20 a week out of pocket that it's costing you. Remember, the government's paying a quarter, the uh, tenant's paying 70%, 20 bucks a week is pretty much the average of what our customers actually cost them a week. So that means it costs you 20 bucks a week to own a 400,000 property. Now, just for the sake of math being easy, let's say that property goes up by 10%, Rocco, in a year, how much has it gone up by? 40,000. 40,000, so you made $40,000 in a year. How easy was that? Could you have saved 40,000 a year easily? after tax very very hard very very hard isn't it yeah but 20 bucks a week is easy yeah so that 20 bucks a week has made you forty thousand dollars a year that's right it's, it's going to make me hold the property as well that's it's the easy, principle of leverage you yeah. get the lever means you get a hundred percent of the benefit but you're only paying a fraction of the cost of holding or owning that property mm. does that make sense to people that's what when you hear the term leverage that's what it's describing, yeah? Yeah. So we'll look at that versus putting money in a super fund. So let's ha say that you had 150,000 invested at your super at 7% return. Yep, not bad. That means over the next 15 years, you'll have grown that 150K into 275,000 by retirement. You know, yeah, it's all right. But if you invest that 150,000 into a property where 350,000 and that went up at 7% per annum, which is under what properties have averaged over the last 50 years. By 15 years in retirement, you've got almost a million dollars from that same 150,000. Does that make it clear for you guys? This is why a lot of people are buying property in their super. Let their, why not get a property and have your boss pay for it, eh, Rocco? Absolutely. Would that be something that we should talk to the team at Asset about looking at that for you as well, Rocker? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. See what I've done. Committing them along the way to various parts of the thing. Now, a lot of people might say, "Oh, well, is eight percent, you know, growth realistic?" Well, let's have a look at what's happened. So, in 1960, when your granddad bought his first house, they were seven thousand dollars each in Australia. In 1990, when your dad bought his, 110,000. Fast forward to today, the median price is over $809,000. So properties have doubled every 10 years in value, guys. So it's fairly safe to say that that growth is realistic, would you say? Yep. All right. So uh, here's my point about getting yeah, the. Sorry. Just letting you know, Hugh um, accidentally he cut out with his reception, so he apologises but says thank you so much. No worries, we'll be able to watch it. All right, now, <laughs> coming down the home stretch, guys, remember we said get to three and you're free? This is how that principle works. We all pay roughly a third of our income on housing, whether it be rent or mortgage. Would that equate for you? About a third of the income goes towards your home? Mm. Right. So that means if you've paid off your own home, You've saved a third of your income, which means if you're on $100,000 now paying a mortgage versus on $66,000 now mortgage-free, your living is the same, correct? Yes. So you've saved a third of your income. Then you've got a, a, someone living in your first investment property paying you a third of their income, and you've got somebody living, living in your second property paying you a third of the income. So a third of an income saved plus a third plus a third basically means you've got 100% of an income without getting out of bed. So once you get to three properties, freehold, you've got options. You can still keep working, you can keep building up that income, or you can actually have a look at it and go, you know what, I've got an income coming in without having to get out of bed. Do I really want to keep going? And it's a really nice conversation to have with yourself. All right, replace your income with rent. So that's the goal, everybody. Financial freedom. Once you've replaced your working income with passive income, you're free to live your life on your own terms. So that's the key, guys.
Oops, I just lost that. that, that. All right, so here's the thing, guys. There's a lot of things there that I know you're keen on. You're keen on finding out. Few's really keen on how fast you can pay off the mortgage. I know that, uh, Rocco, you're super keen on um, finding out how much tax you can save. So here's what we do. The next step is we'll um, spend 10, 15 minutes with you just to collate some data from you on the financial side of things. I'll then pass it on to our financial experts who crunch the numbers, and then we'll book you to meet with them on a Zoom next, and they're actually going to run through a personalised report with you and a plan to achieve all the goals that we're going to outline. Yeah, They'll show you how much faster you can pay off your mortgage, how much less tax that you're going to pay, and pretty much when you're going to be set for retirement, which is be awesome to know. Right, Rocco? Sooner the better, right, brother? That's right. That's for sure. Awesome. All right, so let's just get that underway. All right, so now, Rocco, quickly, let's tally your report. So properties you're interested in were dual keys, right? Yeah. They're the number one. Uh, SMS, you said yes, you'd like uh, to have a look at that. Um, oh, rental guarantee, I forgot to mention, one of the great things about um, working with us is we offer a free three-year rental guarantee with Ray White on all our properties. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about it being rented. They'll guarantee you a minimum return of 4% for a house or 5% per annum for a dual key. Minimum return guarantee for three years. So I'm saying that's a yes too, Rocco? Yeah. And, all right. And obviously, uh, we only work with master builders that offer a structural lifetime warranty. Happy with that? Yeah. Awesome. All right, now we're just going to get some details and you start filling out the next few pages, guys. Sorry. Now, then you get to this bit and you save as. Very important. You'll only do this once. If you don't save as Rocco and Hugh and the date and then save that file, all that information we've just jotted down for these guys will be lost forever. Wouldn't that be frustrating? Yeah. When you save it, I'm sure that you've got someone to send this all to, probably into Cassie, I'm assuming, Cassie, and then um, they take it from there. Yeah, it would be one of, the, one of the selected brokers. Yeah. So, guys, I've also done a short version. That one's probably more educational, good for you. I've done a short version uh, for you um, that uh, I've um, um, done with the guys, so I'm sure you'll have that option as well, just depending on how much time that we took a long time because we're trying to educate as we go. Maybe the shorter ones are a better option, depending on you get a feel for your clients. All right, everyone learned something? Yes. Hands up. Yes. Yep. Awesome. All right, guys, um, that's about it. I've just got one thing I do want to show you. And I'll just find it really, really quickly. If I can... And Stephen Paul, did you want uh, questions to happen after this, or did you want um, maybe we can put together a, a list of questions and send them to Shane for the agents? What did, What do you think? Um, I've got to jump off shortly anyway, so maybe as I said, the the presentation is recorded, um, and it doesn't mean that every agent on here physically has to do this presentation. It means myself and Paul, and maybe one or two of the select agents that want to run through this, we can have some one on ones behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, let's let's put our questions in the chat or, or come back to it if it's okay, so we can finish off the meeting. All right, just quickly, guys, just want to run you through this. So this is on the other presentation, but remember we narrowed it down from all the house types into dual keys through a process of education and elimination. We're going to do the same for where to invest. Yeah, so we know we know what we we're looking for. We know why we're investing. It's for. Um, to save tax for Rocco and to pay the mortgage off for Hugh. Now, where? Yeah? So what, why, where? So where? let's have a look at Australia. Basically, the capital cities are the major markets. So let's start at Darwin. Now, two things you're wanting to achieve, Rocco. You're wanting capital growth, right? Yeah. 
And the number one driver of capital growth is population growth. People move to a market, they need a house, supply versus demand pushes up prices, pushes up rents as well. Very basic principle. And uh, the other thing you're looking for is a decent return or yield. So if you look at Darwin, it's barely growing at 20,000 people per annum. It's well positioned at 460,000, so it's got room to grow and double in our lifetime, which is what you want to see. Decent return, 4.3%, it's not too shabby, but it's too isolated, not enough growth, put a line through it, would you agree? Yeah. Same with Perth, only growing at 25,000. The yield is worse than Darwin, too isolated, et cetera. Adelaide's barely growing. Anyone, any get up and goes, got up and gone out of Adelaide, right, Rocco? <laughs> <laughs> um, Hobart, three, you know, it's nothing. So really in Australian investing property, the East Coast is where the population base is and where the population growth is. So the East Coast is really your only option. Would you agree with that? Yep. So we'll look at Melbourne, where you guys are, 110,000 people growth per annum, which is awesome. Um, it's already at three quarters of a million dollars. So there's not much room for that to go or to grow. Um, and it's only a 2.7% yield. So if I said to you, hey, Rocco, give me three quarters of a million bucks and I'll give you 2.7% return. Are you excited about that investment? No. That, that's investing in the, uh, in, in the uh, Melbourne market, buddy. Mm. Now, I know you're sitting there going, Oh, yes, but it'll keep going up and up in value like Sydney. But here's the thing. Sydney's already at a million dollars. Melbourne's already at three quarters of a million. Every single market has a glass ceiling, guys. Some property sprinklers will say, oh, they'll keep doubling, they'll keep doubling. Absolute rubbish. What happens is the bank will stop lending at eight or nine times of your income. So if you're on 100,000, they'll lend you 800,000. That's it. So if the average income in Melbourne's 100,000 and the average income is already at 750,000, yeah, it's already knocking on the door of eight times, isn't it? So that means people can't borrow money to pay a million, two million, et cetera. So the property values can't keep going up. What you saw artificially happen in Sydney and Melbourne was overseas people coming in with money buying it. It wasn't locals borrowing money from the banks to buy in those properties, uh, those markets. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. So at a million bucks, it's already had its once in a lifetime double. It can't keep going up. It can't double again in our lifetime unless incomes double. And do you think incomes are going to double again in our lifetime, Rocco? No. Probably not, right? So that's why this whole fake thing about properties doubling, 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 it can't keep going, it keeps going until it's at eight times the average income of an area. Which is why, if you look at some of these other options, they offer better opportunity. That's why you bought in um, uh, in uh, Ballarat versus Melbourne. Mm. Yeah? So right. let's look at Canberra, it's interesting. It's only barely growing at 10,000, but it's got a median price of higher than Melbourne. It's very expensive. There's a lot of cashed up people working in good government jobs. <clears throat> The problem with Canberra, apart from it's barely growing, is it's only a 99-year lease. You don't actually get to own the land. I'm sure at some point, Rocco, you'd like to pass it on to your children or the person you're selling it to would like to do so. So it puts a line through Canberra. Sydney's the same. It's growing at 90000 but it's already at that million dollars, so it's gone over the, uh, the uh, eight times the income. And it's a terrible yield for a million bucks, 2.7. So really... The only market that makes sense in today's day and age is southeast Queensland. Growing at 80,000 per annum, almost the same as Sydney, and projections are that that's going to grow faster and overtake Sydney over the next few years. Sydney and Melbourne are full up. There's too much uh, uh, congestion. They've overdone it. It's not fun to live and get around anymore. More and more people are going to be pushed out to the regional centres, and more and more people are going to retire, sell up in those markets, and move up to the north, the coast, where it's warmer and houses are half the price. So guys, bottom line is at 500,000, it can still easily double on our lifetime. And look at that, it's almost a 5% return on your investment. Yeah. So out of all the markets around Australia, which one makes sense then? Southeast Queensland. Queensland. That's it. 
Now, you told me that, not me telling you that. How important is that? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'll leave you with that. Thank I'll you so much, Shane. Piece of pieces, but um, all the best, guys. Have a really great week. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane. Bye, all. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Shane.